You are listening to MCC Geopod, the geopolitical podcast of the Maciej Corvinas Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinek.hu slash en. Welcome to the new episode of the MCC Geopod. My name is Peter Haltai, and here we go again with our co-host Attila Demko, head of the Geopolitical Center of the Matthias Corvinos Collegium. And we have a very special guest today, Anton Berdajewski, who was born in Minsk and grew up there until, until turned 10 or 11. He will tell more about it. He's a foreign policy expert based in Budapest and a journalist. Obviously, a main topic today will be the Belarusian crisis and the recent developments and, and unfortunate events that have occurred even uh, on Belarusian soil. I would like to ask you, Anton, because you you were born there. How was it? What was it be like to grow up in Belarus? And how do you look back now, even as a foreign policy analyst to the Belarusian reality? We left Belarus in 1995. It was one year after Lukashenko came to power. And uh, it was because of political reasons. My father had uh, uh, some Company, his company, and uh, uh, it was taken by by the system, and it looked like um, the system under Alexander Lukashenko uh, started to return to some re-Sovietization to uh, to its past after um, the beginning of the 90s, when um, the questions of Belarusian sovereignty, the questions of democracy, were brought up. After this pretty short period of, of, of few years, uh, under Lukashenko, the system went back to, to its roots or to the previous decades. And uh, my family and um, some of my other relatives left the, countries, the country in the 90s. And uh, ever since, we are uh, following the situation, of course, and uh, we see how the system under Alexander Lukashenko evolved. Um, I would like to remind the listeners that the sanctions against the system is not something new. Uh, the first sanctions were um, um, were uh, made by United States in the end of 90s, and the European Union, as far as I remember, it was in 2002 or 2004, the first sanctions against the, the country. Um, when Lukashenko came to power, um, uh, famous Belarusian politicians just disappeared. Uh, we still don't know what happened to them. Obviously, probably they are not alive anymore. Um, so that's why uh, the reaction of the West was uh, pretty harsh uh, and the beginning uh, at the end of, of the 90s. And then we could uh, we could op- observe some kind of strange circularity in the relationship of Belarus and, and European Union and the West. There were sanctions against the, the system because of some, some of its actions against the opposition, against the democratic rights, and so on. And then um, there was a normalization after three to four years. Uh, sanctions were lifted and everything was all right again, despite the fact that actually nothing has happened um, uh, uh, in human rights and uh, ETC. Um, and then again, some time has passed, again, sanctions, again, a um, few years, and again, uh, returning to um, normal relations. This is because European Union and the West was um, a threat that um, um, because of too harsh sanctions, Belarus might, um, might, uh, uh, might join. Might become even, right? a, even a harder... Dictatorship? Uh, or? Not. They, they were afraid of, of Russia, that Russia would take Belarus, would uh, take the sovereignty of Belarus, and uh, um, European um, uh, measures would uh, force the system of Alexander Lukashenko to turn away completely from Europe and turn towards Russia. That's why, uh, even if, if uh, that we see now, the European sanctions are pretty symbolic. They don't really hurt the system, because if they hurt too much, then probably the system will be completely lo- like lost for uh, uh, for Europe and will be turned inside and uh, turned uh, towards Russia. 
Do you share this opinion, Attila, of of Anton? Absolutely. I think uh, I think the more sanctions are against the regime, it's easier for Putin to control Lukashenko. He is not a friend of his. Actually, Lukashenko for a long time, you know, played both the West and Russia to to gain maximum uh, results. Uh, results, I mean, money and support from Russia and also opportunities on the West. So he played the two uh, two main players, geopolitical players in the region for the benefit of his own regime. And now he's, he's uh, you know, his election failure, I mean, that, that was a sham election. After that, this position became less tenable because, of course, nobody can recognize that, uh, that, that election, what happened in 2020. And uh, nobody can accept the extreme violence against the opposition in the West. That's one thing. But also, when we pressure uh, him and his regime, it makes for Putin much more easier to control uh, Minsk. So it's a it's a it's a geopolitical game between the two uh, two main players. And uh, Belarus is in the middle, and he's losing his room of maneuver with every such move. So that's why I think that this uh, this uh, air piracy um, is serving the interests of Russia very well and uh, and not very good for for Mr. Lukashenko himself actually and not very good for for the West. Yes, and you've just mentioned more or less the reason why we are talking about Belarus these days: uh, the imprisonment of the 26-year-old journalist and blogger Ramon Protasevic, uh, whose imprisonment. Uh, really triggered a loud uproar both in international and regional fora and in the international press as well. And it drew really the attention to to, to the dictatorship or the, the presence of the dictatorship of Alexander Lukashenko. So let's talk a bit about this, this particular event because the question obviously arises why this blogger and his girlfriend who, who was with him on the on this Ryanair flight were so important to them and why did they need to to get them now and to force a plane to to land in Minsk? Um, I think not his concrete person was what was important for for the regime, but um, it was was just um, a a symbolic gesture. So actually anybody would uh, suit the role of uh, this political uh, victim, let's say. Um, Because if we are talking about uh, Raman Protasevic, he, uh, yes, he had a real big impact on um, uh, on the internal affairs of Belarus because of uh, the Telegram channel, which was he was one of the founders and uh, uh, editor-in-chief. Um, and uh, the channel had around two and a half million of, um, of followers uh, during uh, the peak of the protests. However, he, he stepped down in this role as, uh, as editor-in-chief uh, back in the beginning of October. Um, so in the last uh, half year, yes, he had some uh, uh, blogging projects. He was he was helping in another Telegram channel, but he was not um, um, like he was not among the top ten or even tw- top twenty um, uh, top politicians uh, in the opposition. Uh, not even uh, um, a so-called enemy of uh, of Alexander Lukashenko. However, even even more because of um, of um, arresting somebody who who is not uh, like the former presidential candidate uh, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovska or, or Pavel Latushko, who is also an important um, opposition person uh, living in the West and um, propagating against the regime of Alexander Lukashenko. So by arresting somebody who who is of uh, less importance, he is showing to the opposition living abroad and also uh, to the internal uh, of of Belarus. The political risks um, against the West were not so important because uh, the the, uh, line of no return was already passed. However, it was important for him to show for the opposition that uh, um, the system of Belarus, his system, the Belarusian KGB, can reach uh, literally anybody, even living from abroad, even flying, just flying over Belarus. And in this in this regard, it was not so important who is the actual person. So he, if he is a really big leader of the opposition or just a oppositional blogger, uh, uh, 
he was not, uh, I don't know, a former dictator or, <laughs> or somebody who committed uh, serious crimes in Belarus. But in this regard, it was really important to show, to, uh, to frighten the opposition. Uh, and I think this message was, was well accepted by the opposition living abroad. Yeah, I may add that, that Svetlana Tsihanovskaya was flying over uh, Belarusian, uh, Belarus airspace just a week before, and she was not taken. So, uh, in a way, I think it's targeted because uh, um, yeah, Raman is is a more uh, more uh, uh, it's a, he's a better victim for the for the regime for 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 some of his past actions. He can be he can be smeared. He can be portrayed badly in the eyes of the in the eyes of the world, and that's why I think uh, it's it is intentional. Or if it's not, not intentional, then, then, then they, they got lucky. But I think it is intentional. They could have taken down the plane of, of, uh, of the leader of the Belarusian opposition too. But they took a 20-something-year-old blogger, a blogger who was seemingly uh, spending some time in Ukraine with a, with, a, with a unit, with a volunteer unit of bad reputation. So I think they are using it for internal propaganda very well in Russia and Belarus. They are using it for external propaganda in the West that, come on, you are again, uh, like in the case of Navalny, they also started a smear campaign against Navalny that he was uh, extreme right, that he was nationalist. And this is the same case. So I think... And, and sorry, the same is happening against, uh, against Pratash- Pratashevich because yep. a few days ago photos were published about him wearing the uniform of the Azov Battalion portrayed. I mean, this battalion is portrayed as a radical right-wing paramilitary unit present in Eastern Ukraine as well. And yeah, as you've just said, as soon as Pratashevich was arrested at at Belarus, uh, Belarusian and Russian uh, telegram channels, mainly pro-government telegram channels, started aggressively promoting the claims that the journalist fought or or was the the volunteer of this Azov battalion. So what what do we know about this Azov group and the role of, of the blogger the rested blogger in it. So there is a propaganda war. What we know is is very little. What we know for sure that the Russians are using this, and not only not only Russian sites, not like Pravda, not true, but also like Russian proxy organizations within the European Union is, are pushing this agenda, both in Hungary, in Slovakia, everywhere they are using this. So it's that's why I think it. There is a there is a there is a chance that it was intentional that his person was targeted, not only one person uh, from the opposition. Uh, what do we know about Azov? Actually, I had the opportunity to visit and talk to Azov uh, leaders. Uh, well, you know what what you ha- what you look at. How could you visit them? Sorry. Well, I was working <laughs> in the Ministry of Defense, and we had a fact finding V four fact finding mission on the front lines of Ukraine, and we visited uh, Dniepro, we visited Azov, we talked to them. We were treated excellently, by the way. All of these by all of these voluntary uh, volunteer uh, units, um, but you know, in the case of Azov, <laughs> their symbolism is very. Uh, uh, very clear. So it's a it's a Second World War German symbolism what they use. Um, it's a Waffen SS symbolism. But so it's it's an easy target for Russian propaganda. But we talk about a young guy, you know. Uh, we talk about someone who who is very young at the time. Someone who who doesn't maybe doesn't really know what is around him. So it's very clear that that this is only used as a propaganda tool, uh, as a Russian propaganda tool. Uh, but it can work internally. Can you imagine for Russians to see, to see him in an SS-like uniform? That's something to use. For the West, it's also, I mean, I mean, the same case, what happened to Navalny when Amnesty said, well, he's no longer a prisoner, a prisoner of conscience because of his past statements on, on Muslims and refugees. So this is, this is in a way, uh, if it is not a, not a targeted operation, then the Russians and the, and the, uh, are very lucky. I am pretty sure that the Russians are behind this, not only Lukashenko, because it's not good for Lukashenko, this, this thing. It's the best for Putin. However, uh, it is interesting to see that uh, how the issue was brought up in pro-Russian and uh, pro-Belarusian media. 
Um, however, it is important to know that uh, it was never um, a secret from uh, uh, from Nekta or from Roman Pratasevic that he was uh, he was participating in uh, events in um, uh, in Ukraine after 2014. Um, he was talking about it, for example, in a pretty um, a pretty popular interview to uh, uh, Yuri Vduj. Uh, last year, and he was talking about it like, yeah, he was uh, he was watching the events, and he was talking about it that he was a photo reporter, he was a, a journalist who uh, was observing the events in, in Ukraine, and who was following um, different paramilitary groups, and uh, he was at the Donbas front front line. So he was he he never um, made um, a secret about it, and it it is. Um, uh, shown in the Russian media that oh, they just revealed something very, um, very secret, and uh, that oh, you look, this guy is connected to this uh, parliamentary groups. However, we don't know if he is really connected or not. He was, uh, as he claims, and he never, as I mentioned, never made a secret of it. He he was there as a photo reporter, as a, as a journalist, and maybe he was making some photos in uh, in his uniform um, and, and so on. And w there is no real proof of him to um, to fight at the side of Azov, for example. And it's not proved by the pro-Russian media as well. They just brought up the issue that, oh, you are protecting a, a possible uh, neo-fascist or you know, uh, nationalist. So it's important to talk, talk about it because uh, uh, um, because he's, he's not a criminal and even he was uh, posing with his uniform, it doesn't make him a criminal. But is it like, I mean, I'm sure, Anton, you're reading the, the, the Belarusian news sites, pro and, and, and pro-government and the opposition's outlets. Uh, I, I mean, I've been wondering since the beginning of this conversation that why would it be good to portray a 26-year-old journalist as, as a terrorist or as a criminal? I mean, if you, if you think of like a normal person of, of such, you know, a young blogger or journalist trying to help his country, it's not an easy story to sell. I mean, even in a dictatorship when, you know, the majority of media outlets is, is controlled by the government. I mean, do you see, I mean, talking to your Belarusian friends or, or looking at these websites that are they successful in, in this regard to portray him as, as a criminal? Um, on the public level, it is, it is pretty difficult now to see a public opinion or see uh, or even try to find out the public opinion because all these independent media outlets which were there in Belarus, uh, they were closed. Uh, just two weeks ago, uh, they came for Tut.by. It was the biggest um, um, uh, the biggest Belarusian uh, media outlet which was working for over 20 years. And they really tried to um, to be objective, um, and uh, they were really writing about the government opposition and the oppositional uh, position. Uh, so in this regard, after the, the closure, even even them, even to to buy uh, was closed, and they had the reach of uh, three to four million people uh, readers in, in Belarus. After that, it is really hard to find objective media outlets in Belarus because. It, either you are reading um, Belarusian governmental uh, um, position, and for example, if we if we talk about the um, the hijacked Ryanair flight, they were talking about wow, Lukashenko was the hero because he saved he saved the flight. There was a um, a message of potential danger that the flight might have a bomb on board, and it was it, it it is going to be uh, blown up um, um, uh, at Vilnius, and Lukashenko uh, Lukashenko helped the people and helped the the Ryanair flight. And if we are uh, so, this is the official. <laughs> Official position uh, and, and the position against it. It's um, uh, we are talking about media outlets who who emigrated abroad, who are uh, working from Vilnius or Riga or or Warsaw. So it's pretty pretty hard to to find some kind of balance be between this and the government opposition. Now is pretty um, went completely to um, a propagandistic um, uh, direction. It's it's not uh, it's not easy to find out what is actually the uh, the people behind it are thinking. Are they really uh, against Lukashenko and they really uh, think that um, I mean not the people on the streets but the people. Um, around Lukashenko, who are surrounding him, his uh, closest uh, allies, for example, or politicians, 
uh, for them, is 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 the situation obvious, or are they supporting Lukashenko? It's it's pretty pretty hard. It's not like we have they have different uh, um, uh, news, newspapers, for example, where the politicians publish their opinion opinion. Um, Articles or something like that, um, and uh, regarding the people on the street, uh, I think, uh, and also we don't have any opinion polls on that. So it's uh, even before the elections, there were no opinion polls. What will happen to uh, on the election? But I, I, I think, at least as the opposition uh, shows us and um, followers of oppositional channels show us the uh, majority of the population is against Lukashenko now. So I don't think that. Uh, if the government will uh, showcase um, uh, a young uh, journalist as a potential terrorist, it will somehow turn the situation and they will believe the government because this, po as for the Lukashenko, the point of no return was already passed for uh, for the people living in, in Belarus, this point was also passed. Everybody is now uh, like turned into the corner and uh, they are afraid, afraid of the uh, reaction of the government, but it, it doesn't mean that they believe the government or they're supporting it. They're just waiting for the proper moment. We have already touched on the the sanctions of the EU or even the United States more than 20 years ago against Belarus. How do you see, Attila, especially from a geopolitical point of view, what can the EU does in this regard and what they have already done that could work against the Lukashenko regime or how should they follow? So first of all, it's very important to emphasize that, that even if the worst accusations are true, about this young blogger, and I don't think they are true. Even in that case, it's unacceptable what, what the Belarus, Belarus regime did, uh, with the, I think with the backing of Russia. So it's absolutely unacceptable. In terms of sanctions, in terms of what the West can do, there is an illusion that we can change the course of events. If we think that the West can uh, win over in, in Belarus, uh, against Russia, then we don't really understand the power, the real power equation on the ground. Belarus, Belarus is connected to Russia very strongly, by uh, not only by history, by uh, by industrial relations, by by the gas and oil coming from Russia. With much more than that, institutionally, the the KGB is very closely connected uh, to, to FSB, to SVR. These are, the army is very closely connected to the Russian army. So Russia has all, Russia has the high ground in, in Belarus. And actually, I believe that Russia has the high ground in Ukraine. So if the West is picking a fight uh, in, in, a, in a place where we have all the disadvantages, then we're going to lose. So I think whatever, uh, whatever uh, methods we try, uh, I'm not sure that Belarus can be saved in a sense that it will be a stable democratic country. Um, of course, we have to, uh, and I think the EU, NATO, and the US has, has to make clear that, that they cross the line uh, very strongly, and there, there should be, there should be uh, even more targeted sanctions against the regime. We have to, uh, it's always the thing to make it painful for the persons who are making the decision. And that's the trick, because you don't really, you don't always know what is painful for them and what is unbearable for them. Uh, so I, I don't think that there is a solution uh, in, in that case. Solution, solution is an illusion, the same way it's an illusion to think that all those who fight against the regime is, is completely liberal Democrats. It's not true in Ukraine, it's not true in, in Belarus. So it's a, it's a fairy tale uh, that, that, uh, that, that uh, somebody who fights against, uh, against the post-Soviet dictator is, is necessarily a Western Democrat. We should accept, we should accept that that this is the reality on the ground. And this, these are very different countries from, let's say, from the Netherlands. Um, uh, so I think, I think what we should do, what the West should do is, is to see where we can, we can hurt Mr. Lukashenko and his, his circle of cronies. That's one thing. And not to hurt the people of Belarus, because that's not going to help. Because they can sell it. If, if it's going to hurt the life standard of the average people in Gomel, Minsk, Grodno, wherever in Belarus, they can use it against the West. And they are already doing this. They are already doing this, that the West is anti-Russian, anti-Belarus. They say about, you look at how Latvia is oppressing the Russian speakers, 
look at how uh, Poland is uh, looking to, to get our Western regions, which used to, be between the two world wars, uh, belong to Poland, this Grodno region, the, the Western part of Belarus, which was uh, taken in, in 39. There is also a nationalist conflict. There was a nationalist conflict between the Belarus people and the Lithuanians over some territories. They are starting to use this against the West. So if, if, if the people will feel the pain, then it's even easier for, for, the, for the regime and for the propaganda machine to sell that the West is evil. Because they are already doing this. Oh, look at what we did. We took down this plane. They, took, they did the same with the Evo Morales' plane. Uh, they supposed that Snowden was on the plane and they wanted to snatch Snowden, whatever. So I think the whole situa situation is not something easily solved. The best scenario is for Lukashenko to go but I think the decision will be made in Moscow, not in not in Washington or not in Brussels. Uh, well, I'm a bit more optimistic <laughs> in in this regard. I think um, when the protests broke out uh, in um, uh, in August last year, um, it was uh, really a question of luck and the support of Moscow that Lukashenko still remained in power, and if the West press hard on economic sanctions because this is what this is something which we didn't see from the west in the last uh, decades uh, against against belarus uh, so Ati also mentioned that belarusian economy is very uh, industry oriented and it is um, orientated on the um, on the state sector so the majority over 50% of of the belarusian gdp comes from uh, state uh, property, state corporations. And if um, the European Union can uh, hurt in this direction, can hurt the Belarusian state companies um, um, through, I don't know, credit uh, policy, through uh, limitations of export import, then it will hurt the system. And uh, maybe we can compare Belarus right now, and this is what uh, Lithuania and Poland does, we can compare Belarus to the situation in, in Baltic countries and Poland in the 80s, when um, there was really high um, level of, of uh, opposition against the Soviet system. Uh, the people were um, um, uh, conspirating against the system, uh, but uh, they couldn't reach uh, any success because of the strong, strong presence of the military, or the support of the military, the support of uh, um, uh, police, uh, uh, and so on. But um, within one decade, the system collapsed, and also the Soviet system has, has collapsed. So this is what, um, what we can hope about, that the system doesn't have even a decade, maybe a few years, and uh, uh, further economic sanctions will speed up the collapse of the system. However, it is also important to note, that Ati also mentioned it, that this is, um, uh, this is something which, on the other hand, really hurts the population. Because economic sanctions will, will hurt, first of all, the, the Belarusians who, who are living in the country. Uh, and we can also see that um, from uh, these very simple sanctions against the Belarusian companies flying to Europe, and European companies flying over or flying to Belarus, because for simple Belarusians living in the country, right now it is also almost impossible to go to Europe. Because of the uh, coronavirus, uh, the uh, borders, if they go by car, the borders are already closed, so they, they can't cross the uh, border of Poland or Lithuania. The only way for them was to travel by flight. And now these options are also closed. So from Belarus right now, if somebody who wants to leave the country, they can go either to Moscow or to Turkey. Right now, maybe some other directions, but to Europe, they're completely cut, cut off from, uh, from European part. And, 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 and as you've just said, people will be able to, to travel to Moscow, to Russia, and not to Europe. And maybe this is symbolic in terms of the geopolitical dynamics of the present or, or even the future. Because just a few days after the imprisonment of, uh, of Pratasevich, um, Lukashenko was seen on the side of Putin in Sochi on a boat trip. It, it's, well, it's also a question of political maneuver that Lukashenko is trying to do. And Atiyah uh, mentioned that before. Um, 
Lukashenko is playing a geopolitical game in Russia in the last uh, decade, decade or more. Uh, he he tries to turn to the West while trying to benefit from uh, from Russia through cheap Russian oil, cheap Russian gas, uh, through the support of uh, of Russia, and this room of maneuver seemed to. Uh, disappear uh, after the uh, last year's uh, protests when they uh, when they started. However, um, in the last half year, it seemed that Lukashenko again uh, managed to somehow um, strengthen its positions because uh, when uh, they first met uh, in the last one year, when they first met in Sochi in September last year. Probably he promised some things to Putin. Uh, one one of the uh, of the promises was uh, regarding the change in the Belarusian uh, constitution, which might result in his um, uh, in his resignation in the in the near future. Um, uh, and the second promise probably was regarding the integration of of Belarus and Russia. And uh, of course, both promises were done because Lukashenko was in a very uh, unfortunate situation uh, when uh, hundred thousands of people were marching the streets of, of Minsk and he really needed the support of Russia. But of course, he wants to stay in power and he tries to uh, save the power for himself. So he tries not to uh, uh, give up the sovereignty of, of the country. And in the meantime, uh, we've seen the return of uh, Alexei Navalny to Russia, the, um, uh, the Western um, reactions on that, the demonstrations uh, in Russia, um, Joe Biden coming to power in the United States, which weakened the positions of Russia. And Lukashenko could tell uh, Vladimir Putin that, look, uh, you also have problems in your country. So, um, well, maybe we should... Uh, slow down a bit the integration of the, the two countries. Um, and actually, in, in the last months, they met with Putin three times. So we know that Russia is press, pressing Belarus hard to, uh, I think, on the issues of, of the integration. For example, the joint uh, military uh, is something which is important for Putin. Uh, maybe um, join, um, combining some uh, ministries, uh, so integration on political level as well as uh, economic level. And uh, Lukashenko tried hard to push back this, uh, these issues. And after the, the, the uh, situation with the Ryanair flight, uh, again, his room of maneuver de just decreased. And uh, it's, uh, well, yeah, we are talking about the meeting with Putin, but just one day before the meeting with Putin, the prime minister of Russia traveled to Belarus as well. So it was, uh, Belarus was targeted from Russian uh, side in, in several directions. And I think they are losing the ground in this regard. Yeah, I completely agree. It's terrible to say, but if it's not for Lukashenko, who, who really doesn't like Putin and, and vice versa, uh, there would have been a much more integration between the two countries in the last two decades. So the Union state was agreed upon in 1999, so 22 years ago. And the integration was, uh, was uh, thwarted from the side of Belarus, not from the side of Russia. Russia was pushing, 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 and Lukashenko was resisting. And the weaker Lukashenko is, uh, I think, the less chance to resist uh, this, this very strong Russian pressure, which can be helped with economic tools also, but also, also uh, let's say, not conventional tools. For example, when Putin talks about the attempt on the life of Lukashenko, well, you know, I would call it, uh, maybe there is a attempt from the opposition or the West, I don't think so, that from the West, but uh, it's also a threat. If, 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 a, if a Russian leader talks about that, uh, whatever is in the mind of Putin, Lukashenko will understand it as a threat. Um, so what I'm saying that, uh, that the issue is in the next few years, for Belarus, can resist further integration or not? Uh, and if not, then we have a changed geopolitical landscape since uh, Belarus is very important for Russia militarily. It was already mentioned that, that, that the Belarusian military is very close to the Russian military. But can we imagine Russian bases on the just 150 kilometers from Kiev from the north? Ukraine already has to watch. And this is, we didn't talk about, uh, there, was, there were good relations between Lukashenko and, uh, and Mr. Poroshenko uh, uh, after, after the Maidan. So Belarus did not 
really recognized the uh, the, uh, the Crimea, uh, the, the grab of Crimea by Russia. He was between he, he was between saying yes or no. Um, but now we can see that Belarus and Ukraine is in the, is in the worst relationship ever since uh, since 1991. So it's it's changing of the geopolitical landscape already. And if Russia manages to draw Belarus in, and I'm I'm, I'm not optimist, I'm not pessimist. I, it's 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 not. We don't know. Actually, we cannot predict uh, the future since there are so many so many uh, unknowns. I think an accident can happen to Mr. Lukashenko at any time. Uh, I, I don't think the Russians dare to do this, but I, I I thought a lot about Russians not daring to do something. I didn't. I never thought that they will take Crimea uh, in 2014. I thought there will be a Crimea Republic, a la Abkhazia or or South Ossetia. So what I'm I'm saying that we are at a, at a very important uh, crossroads. Lukashenko is pushed into the hands of of of. Putin, he must be viewed as somebody who still, because of himself, not because he's a great patriot of Belarus, who wants to keep Russia away. And if he's gone, we don't know who will replace him, if a crony of Putin or can be a, an independent person, we just don't know. So there are a lot of unknown unknowns, but it's very sure that on a tactical level, we have seen a Russian victory in the last uh, last year, and especially now with this uh, with this uh, hijacking. And the, the situation is not that simple. With Nord Stream 2, I think both the position of Belarus and Ukraine got weakened very seriously via, via Russia, since both pipeline systems uh, will be less important. Um, and there are many other things which I don't think that Putin is that, that weakened. And, and the last thing, and I don't want to talk much more, the last thing is we don't really know who is coming after Putin and if he is uh, less of a nationalist or more of a nationalist. Because we always think that Putin, uh, if Putin f falls, he will be replaced by a liberal democrat. That is not at all sure. I am not sure that Nav Mr. Navalny, if he one day would be president, would be much more accommodating on Ukraine or on Belarus. And we don't know who is replacing uh, one day because Putin will not last forever. Nobody lives forever. Who is replacing him? So I'm not that sure that this game is uh, is uh, is going to be over in 10 or 15 years on Belarus. Anton Bendarzewski and Attila Demko, thank you for joining me here today on this MCC Geopod. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this MCC Geopod episode. For further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors and students, check out our knowledge base at corbinec.hu slash en.